Yeah, so this is the work that I have done with my colleagues uh, in Symantec Research Labs, and the problem that we are trying to solve is basically if at all it's possible to predict future uh, cyber attacks. Um, so in 2010, when Stuxnet actually hit the news, the cyber community uh, got into the realization that the, cyber, the damage cyber attacks can cause was beyond our imagination. So we had to not only secure our, our traditional uh, technologies that we use for our cyber operations, but also the critical infrastructures and every node that is direct or indirectly connected to internet. Our life definitely became more difficult. Um, unfortunately, the new industrial revolution didn't really help the situation. With Industry 4.0, now uh, we have many more de devices that are connected to, to the internet. Uh, we digitalize more, uh, we share more, and we outsource many of our operations to third parties that reside on the cloud. This uh, definitely made our uh, life um, easier, uh, more efficient and flexible, but at the same time made us also weaker because there were many uh, other uh, penetration points for the attacker. While for us to feel secure, we had to provide security to do every node uh, that has impact on our security. For the attackers, actually, it was enough to, to compromise only one of the, one of the nodes. So if they are actually, they were always uh, one step ahead of us. Um, well, uh, we, our, our, our life became more complex uh, as the security defenders. Uh, the, the attacker at the same time got uh, more skilled and organized to, their, um, to realize their operations. So uh, what are we going to do about this? So for countering cyber threats, um, what, we be, what we believe is that we have to uh, establish uh, a, a very well a risk analysis so that we know which elements in our network actually is vulnerable and to attacks. Uh, we have to deploy multiple layers of security, which include not only our traditional defense mechanisms like IDSs and Navy products and so on, but also um, maybe uh, employee training programs and tri trusted uh, security advisors. And uh, maybe even we have to purchase cyber insurance so that when the attacks happen, uh, we, can, we can actually uh, mitigate the damage. And the, the third thing that we believe is very important is to set up proactive defenses. So what if we knew which organization will get attacked uh, in advance? Uh, which applications will be vulnerable and will, get to, uh, will be chosen by the attackers to be exploited? What if we knew which websites will, uh, will get um, attacked and compromised? Uh, which machines in our, in our network actually is uh, going to be uh, infected? And most importantly, when the attack will really know, when will the attack will really happen, and when it happens, what did we do wrong about it? So what we're hoping is that <clears throat> with predictive modeling, we can find answer to these questions. Also finding answer to some of these questions will help the organization on the prioritization step because actually deploying multiple layers of security is very expensive and you might not be able to deploy every advanced technology on every node in your, in your uh, enterprise and you want to uh, choose the, one, the riskier ones. Um, obviously, prediction actually is also very useful for the, for the new um, cyber insurance topic, uh, which is very popular in the last couple of years, for, for being able to do pricing or for the underwriting tools, actually prediction or uh, well-established risk analysis is very important. To do um, risk prediction accurately, you have to understand the cyber key uh, cyber uh, risk drivers very well. Um, so when you're doing analysis, you try to, I think you should uh, include as much as possible, you should be able to cover as much as possible all of the components in this figure. So you have to be able to understand the threats they're, they're, uh, and the attackers who is who and their motives. And you, ha you have to uh, do a well-established uh, vulnerability analysis, not only on the applications, or on the processes or third parties, but also on, on, the, on the users, because sometimes, even if you deploy a very good security in your enterprise, if the user itself actually is vulnerable and doesn't know about security, he might be just opening the, the email attachment that he's not supposed to open, and the user is infected. And after that, as the previous um, presenter mentioned, it's very easy for the attackers to get, uh, the, to compromise actually the admin machines where they could do uh, whatever they wanted to do. 
Of course, you have to also uh, uh, do analysis about the vulnerabilities, uh, values at risk. You have to, because uh, after all, if you don't have anything interesting, the attackers will not uh, attack you. So um, if you have high reputation, if you are a richer company, typically the, the companies that ha have higher revenue are attacked more. So this kind of, including some kind of indicators in your analysis from this uh, um, category also is uh, valuable. In this figure, I try to summarize um, so most of the components that are important that have, a, have an effect on the risk of an enterprise. Uh, and, uh, and some of the previous works have already tried to do some form of prediction, for example, to try to uh, guess which websites will get uh, attacked uh, and compromised. And some, some works uh, have uh, analyzed the uh, uh, deep forums to try to figure out which, uh, which attacks will happen in the future. And some of the works uh, have, uh, that are very actually uh, related to our work uh, try to <coughs> measure the risk of an enterprise uh, against breaches using um, basically <clears throat> looking to the enterprise from outside in using publicly available data. So they were basically checking um, the misconfiguration details on the servers, and they have found out that if the, the, the misconfiguration of, for example, the DNS server and so on, have very high correlation with future attacks. So what we wanted to do is basically to check, um, to look to the enterprise from inside and see if we could actually predict better, so if we could uh, achieve higher accuracy. So in this work, uh, we have used uh, semantics uh, internal data. So we have been collecting um, information uh, from about all the files that uh, appear uh, on the computers of our customers since a very long time. Um, and in this data, I just have to tell that the data is completely anonymized and we cannot really know which for the, what the, uh, the data belongs to, which company the data belongs to. Um, and so basically here, we um, try to figure out if the file download behavior of uh, users, of machines, actually have any kind of correlation with future infections. So we calculated um, over 80 features, but they could be summarized into four categories. Uh, the first category basically uh, the, uh, is, um, it covers basically the uh, file download statistics, so you, you try to calculate which, what are the number of files that are downloaded over a period of time and so on. Uh, the second category is the vulnerability patching behavior. We check the vulnerability um, status of uh, known client applications on the computers. Then we also I try to see if particular, uh, the existence of particular applications on the computers have any correlation with future attacks. Uh, so we tr somehow do uh, profiling and try to identify, for example, the admin machines or uh, software developers and so on, or some servers that, are, that might be more interesting for the attackers. And obviously, we also do historical threat analysis. So typically, when you, like most of the, let's say, is, uh, especially in cyber insurance um, uh, field, when they do risk assessment, they would just use the historical threat uh, feature. So they would check, they would assume that if a company gets uh, infected once, they will get infected again. So we wanted to include some of those features and check if this is, this is really true, or if they have any kind of correlation, and if it has any kind of help on the overall prediction. So the file download statistics uh, features, uh, the first category is volume-based features. So we try to measure if, uh, if the users, if the machines with abundant and varied download behavior actually ha are more likely to get infected. So here the features cal we calculate is like number of files and hashes and, and file names that are uh, seen over a period of time. Uh, we check the fraction of infants from top signers and um, top uh, file hashes. And we also uh, calculate the number of distinct um, applications that are installed. Then the second set of features are the temporal download behavior features. So here we try to actually measure if uh, longer working hours have uh, higher correlation with being infected. So we, as we assume that if a person works actually longer times, probably during the work time, will be doing some procrastination and will probably access wrong websites and get uh, malware or like uh, a, a, a file that is uh, going to result in some malware download after. So the features we have calculated here are fraction of events during daytime, evening time, night, and weekends, and so on. And we also calculate uh, simple statistics over 
uh, the urinal number of events and monthly number of events and try to see if there is any change over time. The third set of features that we calculated are prevalence-based features. Since we have a file download behavior of over one million uh, machines, uh, we are able to actually do a very nice prevalence analysis and we know that if a file existed only once or uh, <coughs> twice, and here we try to measure basically if the computer typically has a low prevalence files, uh, like polymorphic files, or maybe uh, typically the, the, the computer has like, you know, leg legitimate benign applications. So the obvious features that we calculated uh, are related to vulnerabilities and the patching behavior. Um, here, basically, um, we did correlate the national vulnerability information from na national vulnerability database with our data and try to match um, vulner vulnerable applications with their patches. Um, so here, this is actually a, a very, uh, it requires a lot of manual effort because uh, actually, there is no existing data that will tell you this is this hash is the patch and this hash for the for this hash this vulnerable hash. So since we don't have this information, we need to identify, for example, a number of applications ourselves manually and find uh, all the hashes that correspond to those applications and their versions and uh, and so on. So it was actually a pretty uh, heavy uh, manual uh, work. Uh, so. Because of this, uh, we, need, we couldn't actually include uh, the vulnerability analysis of all uh, applications that existed on the, on the machines, but uh, we decided to choose a set of applications that are typically, um, that are representable for uh, common um, infection vectors, like for example, the browsers, you would get driver by download attacks, and you might get like from Adobe Reader, some phishing attacks and so on. Uh, and we, uh, we assume that well, we believe that if uh, a user actually doesn't patch these applications, probably he will not be patching the others as well. So uh, probably statistically we're not losing much. So for example, um, this, we, we, we try to show like for, for one enterprise how the vulnerability state look like. And as you can see, um, actually it takes really a lot of time like uh, uh, to uh, kind of patch most of, most of uh, to see that you, most of your um, machines are almost completely patched. So this, this shows that uh, the, vulner the most of the enterprises actually don't do anything about, especially the client side uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, the third set of feature that we uh, analyze our application uh, is about application download behavior. So he, we wanted to see uh, if uh, the attackers actually uh, aim for target typically um, some critical machines more than the others. So uh, using some ground truth about applications uh, downloaded, we were able to identify uh, the, the machines that have DB servers, FGN servers, and uh, that could be uh, admin uh, machines because they have some um, system administration tools and so on. And another set of uh, features that we tried, another question that we wanted to uh, find answer to was if the machines that have some hacking tools or system, system administration tools are more interesting for the attackers. So as the, as, as the first uh, presenter mentioned, like in Target, for example, they have used a lot of uh, off-the-shelf tools to try to exfiltrate data out, like, uh, and they do some scanning and so on on the, on the, on the network to find the interesting uh, machines. And so we wanted to see if actually attackers are t targeting the, the machines that will have this uh, that will have these applications already, so they will not need to copy things from outside in. Because some, even like trying to copy these things from um, from the from the internet, might be actually detected by the IDSs. So, so obviously we apply some machine learning, and uh, we have applied random forest. We chose to configure the random forest to 200 trees, and uh, I just wanted to show like a simple. Uh, idea of how random forest works, but I guess uh, this probably everyone knows about it. Uh, we also ha we also wanted to try uh, another um, learning algorithm, which is uh, semi-supervised. So the reason why we did this was because in when we when we looked into the enterprise data, typically um, for some enterprises, especially, it's really hard to find label data. Either they are too clean, or they are too infected, and so. Also, they have like imbalance issues and so on. 
So we wanted to see if we could apply a form of uh, label propagation on the, the, the known cases, if you could still achieve a good prediction accuracy. And I'll try to show uh, in the evaluation if, uh, which kind of result we, we were able to obtain. So we used data uh, that covers 2015. So we had 4.4 billion logs uh, from 600K machines that belong to 18 enterprises. And obviously, ground truth, defining the ground truth here is very important um, because you don't want to mislabel uh, things. Um, and we're hoping that we have a really good ground truth because uh, we have a reputation-based system uh, that's uh, a product that uh, can identify malware by just uh, reputation. And this, uh, this uh, product actually is using a very large uh, labeled data that has been uh, you know, verified by, by our uh, colleagues since long time, and we're hoping that this, this is pretty accurate. Uh, so we know about, uh, in, this, in this data set, we have 16 million uh, known benign and 214 million known um, uh, malicious uh, file hashes. In addition to that, obviously, we, ha we also have information about that we can gather from our AV and I, IPS products. So we can, we can know, uh, we, we knew, uh, we collected around 800 million file hashes that were flagged by the AV. And also we have infection reports. So, so for some cases, if, even if the AV product is not able to identify the malware, uh, we can actually detect the, the, mal the, the attack by the net analyzing the network traffic. So, this will actually show uh, a clear sign of uh, infection because probably because the, the machine will be trying to contact a CNC server, for example. So in our experiments, we try to find answer to uh, four questions. The first one is, what is the most optimal learning and uh, prediction period? So for, for how long we have to train the classifier and for how, for how fast we can actually predict the incidents. So, we have basically shuffled the data and tried to see like if we what 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 is the best um, what 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 is the best uh, learning and prediction period and what we have found was that around six times if you have like six months of data typically you start producing good results um, and uh, and we can guess um, the infections that will happen in the next six months. Obviously, this sounds maybe not so cool, but you know in reality prediction is a very difficult. Uh, problem. So if you want to actually increase the accuracy, obviously you might want to include many more other factors like you might want to um, um, do a risk assessment including all the, all the nodes that I, I showed in the, in the, in the figure uh, when I was making the introduction. So the, the second question we wanted to answer was can we really do prediction? And, uh, and if, if we can, what are the most discriminative features? And and if the label data is too small or imbalanced, can actually uh, we can still pro uh, provide accurate predictions. So, using uh, Tanfos cross validation, we actually achieved a really good prediction accuracy. So we have 96% true positives, 5% false positives. Um, although 5% might sound a little bit high uh, for malware detection problem, actually for prediction this number is really. Uh, the best that is achieved to date. Uh, the previous work, for example, that we're trying to identify to be infected uh, enterprises, uh, actually, uh, were for, for this amount of true positives, was producing around 20% false positives. So, and this, this still is a very big achievement. So uh, I believe that this number is really good. So the, the feature that co contributed the most are interesting. Uh, for example, Opposed, as opposed to the, um, the belief of most of, for example, the cyber insurance uh, industry, the trust uh, history-based feature actually do not correlate as much as the other features. So if you get infected in the past, it doesn't really mean you're going to get infected again. Uh, for some cases, of course, it happens. I'm not saying it doesn't have any correlation, but it's not very high. So the, the best features actually were uh, volume-based features and time-based features. So indeed, like, um, uh, working uh, at the weekends uh, actually have a high correlation with, with being infected. So here I listed um, the top features. Um, and as you can see, for example, a uh, fraction of events for, on the weekends and uh, weekdays actually uh, is the highest uh, feature that co uh, contributed to the result. Then the fraction of events from the top 
uh, 100 file hashes also uh, is an important feature to distinguish. The number of patch apps as, uh, as it makes sense and number of, total number of events and the, the severity of, uh, of the patch applications and, and the list goes on like this. So we wanted to also, as I said before, we wanted to experiment a little bit with semi-supervised uh, label propagation and we did to try to see if the training data is too small or imbalanced, if we can predict it still well. And we compared our, our, our label propagation with the classic random forest because we use that one for the other uh, part of the uh, work. So here the P means uh, we randomly select basically um, per P percent of the mal malicious samples uh, and Q percent of the benign samples. So here, as you can see, uh, we, we chose to uh, decrease the number of benign cases a lot. And the main reason for this was that Actually, identifying infecting machines is way easier than identifying really clean machines. So, um, in most of the cases, what we have, what we see is that um, most of the computers have a lot of files that are like in the gray zone. So, we don't know if they are malicious, uh, but they, they might be. They have singletons. We cannot really identify if they are good or bad. And in some cases, for example, if the computer has a web browser, um, a web server. Uh, it will produce a lot of singletons. And this is actually benign, but we're not able to really say if this is benign or not. You know, no one actually had this hash. No one's seen it before. So that's why we really decreased a lot the benign cases, and we wanted to see if we can still uh, provide interesting results. So as you can see, for example, in the case of like 20, we got the 20% of the malicious samples uh, infected uh, machines and 0.1% of the clean machines in our, uh, in our experiment. And you can see that actually with, with semi-supervised learning, you can achieve better results with, uh, compared to the random forest. I mean, with random forest, if you have very little number of cases, actually, you're not able to produce good results. So you, get, you degrade a lot on the, on the experiment. So to, con to conclude, um, because cyber uh, incidents became more un unavoidable, uh, the businesses are trying to shift their focus from reactive security to proactive security. Uh, they want to they want to be ready when the attacks happen. They want to know which which in machines in their uh, enterprises will get in, in, uh, impacted. Now, uh, most of the even though in the academia we have devised a lot of um, malware detection or you know uh, security products uh, uh, security solutions, most of those solutions in reality are very expensive to deploy in in, in real world. Uh, so, for example, uh, we have propose a lot of systems that uh, rely uh, on virtualization, but this is really expensive. So how do you actually really uh, run um, on every machine? If you see a file that is like, looks like a little bit uh, uh, fishy, uh, you have to run this thing on a virtual machine, this will be super slow. Or, you know, like for example, in most of the products now you have some uh, form of policy. So if you see that the file, file looks a little bit fishy, then you don't allow this file to do a lot of uh, critical things on the computer. But this produces a lot of false positives and it's very expensive. So they're actually the uh, enterprises, the businesses are very interested in having uh, prediction and to try to uh, prioritize, prioritize uh, this uh, in this matter. And another topic is actually cyber insurance. Uh, cyber insurance became very, very popular in the last couple of years and they're really hungry for accurate risk assessment methodology. So they really don't know, there are some methodologies already that are existing, like for example, they would use publicly available data because they don't have internal data from companies, but the accuracy that you can achieve with that is really, really low. So, um, and in the end, you know, those packages cost really a lot of money. So maybe this model will tell you that you are um, very risky and you have to pay, I don't know, millions of dollars, but in reality, you are a very clean machine and you, you're very secure and you will never get in, in you know, uh, infected, so you're gonna pay more for nothing. So this is really important, and you know, we have to really work on trying to provide uh, good methodologies for predictions. Um, we try to, uh, we achieved a good, fairly good prediction accuracy already, but I don't think this is enough. I mean, we have to really do more. We have to be able to um, guess, maybe do guesses for shorter periods of time, not for six months, but maybe for, for a week or for, for a couple of days in advance. Or you should also do causality analysis. Obviously, those features 
are somehow correlated with future uh, attacks, but we still don't know what was the real reason. Why? I mean, because you went to this website or because you're just not uh, careful and you're opening all the attachments in your computer. We don't know what was the real, real reason of, of, uh, of the uh, infection so, so that we could fix. So obviously there is a lot that can be done and I'm hoping we will work on this topic in the future and do amazing things. And thank you for now and I can accept questions if you have. Thank you. Very good talk, uh, JN RIT. Um, two questions. One is for clarification. One is for your high-level uh, thinking based on your your research. Clarification. So you have when you say that it is a true positive, do you mean a machine being infected or do you mean a malicious file in a machine? Because you mentioned about 800 million in fact, files, so it's really the machine files. Infected, yes. Machine, but a so machine can have multiple that, files. Well, I mean, the machine got the file and then connected, contacted the DNC server. Okay, that relates to another part of your features, right? So if you look at the whole year, that's your data set, that the features you have on that machine could be cumulative up to the time the machine was infected. So are you looking at, so that can change. One machine may be infected in January, the other machine may be infected in June, the other may be infected in December. How, how do, do you have different kind of cumulative time frame of the features for different machines? Or are you looking at the entire years of the features, regardless of when the machine is infected? How, how do you do that? So, I mean, uh, as I said, so one of the features actually about the infection, the history of infection. So let's say that we're doing like the, the analysis, feature extraction for six months, right? We extract all the features, and, and during this time, actually this machine got infected already, and we also use this as a feature, so we know that this machine is infected, right? And then we, we label this data the, with, the, with the data on the future. So we know that like six months later, this machine will get is infected again. Okay? So you only use the and features up that. to... Okay. So we can talk later. Sorry. Hi, I love this topic. You have great data. Uh, Stefan Savage, UC San Diego. Uh, I'd like to talk about prediction a little bit. So uh, it... it Basically, what you've shown is that we can take six months of data and then we train a classifier and we say, hey, we will predict whether one of these machines will be compromised in the next uh, six months. And the reason, in the end, that that is most valuable for an enterprise is so that they can do something about it. And so what I'm interested in, because whenever you have something with these complicated sets of features that are linearly related, you could say, well, please try to explain this to me. How would I change a set of features? And in fact, you'll have multiple different solutions. I could make this, this, and this not happen on this machine, and that would make it less likely or something else. But in fact, only one of those is responsible for how it got compromised yes. in the future. And so I'm curious if you've looked at the compromises to see if it helps you understand the explanatory power of your classifier. Like what things... What you'd really love to come I mean, out of this. You're saying you're talking about the causality work, right? Exactly. What no, should no, I do? No, no. Indeed. I mean, un un unfortunately, I don't have a data to be able to do this kind of work, and I'm hoping to work on this uh, as a future work. Uh, obviously, this is also one of. I mean, this work actually is already implemented as a product in my company, and we deployed this thing, and we're showing this thing to our customers, and they're using it. And oh, the first question is this one, obviously, right? They tell me, what can we do now? And we say, like, look, I mean, we don't really know what happened because we don't have the data. We don't, I mean, we don't have, like, a fish. I mean, right, right now you're just telling them, be the nervous. Sets around, right? It's really hard, unfortunately. Uh, but, uh, I mean, at least, like, you see, it looks like your clients are not patching their vulnerabilities. Patch them because, you know, if they will, you know, browse somewhere, they will get infected with that, maybe, right? So this is, this is the current state. Unfortunately, I wish I was able to, you know, find an answer to your question. I mean, that's really something that I would love to do okay. uh, in the future. Yeah, thank you. Nicholas Christian, Carnegie Mellon. Thank you. Uh, this was a fun talk. I have a question which is kind of a um, follow-up on Stefan Savage's question. And that's about some of your features, the, uh, the CVSS and the NVD database. Uh, that seems like it's going to be a really good explanatory feature for popular applications, like what you had, Silverlight and others. But for the crappy little, you know, weather plugin that I downloaded and that happens to be a cesspool of, you know, bad code, it's not clear that there's going to be a CVSS. So I was wondering if those features were really important to your classification. 
And if so, if you had thought about alternatives for those, yeah. you know. I mean, CVSS core is one of the features that works well, but not like the, the most, the, the biggest contributor. Um, so I actually kind of do a couple of ex uh, experiments, like excluding all the vulnerability features and running them on what happens. And you, you still have like a good prediction. Actually, I mean, even if you exclude some of those features, you still have good prediction. And yes, I mean, this is a problem. I, initially, when I started this work, I said, I'm going to label everything. I start going and like all the abbreviation, all these weird things, it's impossible. I mean, it's really very hard to do it. And maybe actually if you were, if there was a data set like this that is available, like hash to hash, you know, matching, maybe actually we could do the causality analysis even because we will find which vulnerability was, you know, exploited, let's say. So I have an idea for you. Maybe you don't care about the CVS score. You care about whether that's the latest version of a given application or not. And you guys yes. at Symantec have actually data to be able to tell whether something is outdated or not. Yes. Whether there's a vulnerability or not, maybe that yes. doesn't matter as much as yes. the age of the yeah, I mean, software. This, I mean, the CVS score is not so important, but like the patching time, like how long it takes to patch. I mean, it's an important thing. Like, as I said, if those 20 applications are not patched, I'm sure the others are not patched either. So, which is even worse. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, great work. Yeah, I was wondering if in your risk analysis you are also trying to differentiate sort of like the type of adversary that might be compromising this network. So I can imagine if a company is interested in uh, purchasing or uh, cyber insurance, they might not care, for example, if, if it's like a, like if a random computer in their network is compromised and starts sending spam versus, for example, if you're the North Grumman and some, like, someone tries to steal your the plans for you, the next fighter yet, or something like that, or, or somewhere, so somewhere in the middle, like a target approach. So there's different types of potential sort of like compromises, and that's going to, uh, yeah, in my opinion, that's probably the biggest type risk. Threats, right, also. Type, I'm sorry? Also different type of threats. I mean, right. like, for example, the company might be interested in ransomware, but not like, right now, this is also a general thing. You'll say, you'll only say you will get, you will get impacted, that's it. And one of the reasons we couldn't actually do this work was because I didn't have enough data. I mean, it might sound a bit ironical that I'm in semantic and I don't have all the data, but I don't normally. Uh, so I got access to this data uh, for 18 enterprises. Right now I have it more, and I'm hoping to run everything and try to do this uh, risk prioritization because this is one of the things that also the customers ask for. Very quick high level. So uh, your prediction, do you think that this is stationary? Do you think that this will be apl applicable next year, the year after? The yeah, same kind of features? We are, we are run, we are running this thing, actually. And it's so continue on that, the same kind of features. Okay. Uh, 90% accuracy. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you.